Welcome to the KSO Sunday Show. Mason Voth, Drew Galloway here with you. Probably thinking, man, it seems like a weird setting. Man, you're kind of turned weird and looking funny. Yeah, you know, we do the best uh, with what we can when we're on the road. So we are in uh, the business center at this Hyatt, uh, just having the time of our lives, trying to forget about K-State's loss against Cincinnati. The only problem is, Drew, I'm looking at Drew, if you guys are wondering what I'm doing. The only problem is, can't forget about it when it happened like two hours ago, and it was a big one for K-State that they needed. They had a chance to. They got an awesome performance by Tyler Perry, and as much as we can't forget about that loss right now, might be good if the team does because they got to turn around on Tuesday for what Jerome Tang called their toughest game of the season or their biggest game of the season when they go on the road to face Kansas. And he made it clear, look, this was a quad one opportunity, but we have two more quad one opportunities at KU and at home against Iowa State to round out the season. So we already talked about what happened in the game and the instant reaction. We can talk about more of the big picture stuff and focus a little bit on what Jerome Tang said and also the direction of this team and how strong we think they can finish and how reasonable it is to think that they might be able to get a couple of significant wins over the course of the next two weeks, including the Big 12 tournament. Yeah, it it just and, and this is where it's tough, you know, doing it on the the Saturday and not really sleeping on it because it's all that we've really been thinking about or in anything is that it, it just sucks because of how it played out. And like you out rebound, out free throw, out shoot from three Cincinnati and lose. So small picture like this really sucks for K State to lose that game like that. Big picture, it just gets a lot tougher because like like we've talked about after some home losses, and I remember saying this all the way back in January start of conference play when K State lost at Texas Tech, that the thing that really sucked about it is that your margin of error it becomes just so much thinner because if K-State closes out that game against Texas Tech or closes out the game against TCU even, you're feeling a lot better of how everything played out. And I also think that this is another part of the game being on Saturday. We record this Saturday night, and the thing that kind of keeps I keep going back to is how everything went kind of exactly how K-State needed it to today. And you couldn't get the job done because Villanova beats Providence at Providence. That's probably going to be a quad one win for K-State. USC beats Washington at Washington. Washington's not great, but we've seen how winning on the road increases your net. That might not be a quad three loss anymore. Virginia it shouldn't play basketball anymore, at least on one end of the floor, and got destroyed today by Duke. Uh, Wake Forest, another bubble team lost like it, it felt like everything was coming up roses for k-state so to lose that game makes it feel just that much more defeating well and so there's the the disappointment of all that and you waste a game like that from tyler perry where you said it but like that was the over my dead body game and he gave that kind of performance for k-state where he was knocking down shots some of them were hey that's what we wanted to see all season from you, where you got a decent look, knock it down, you're an elite shooter. And then there were the ones also involved in that where it's like, how do you make that kind of shot? Like the one he did to give K-State a 72-71 to 71 lead. The issues, though, they just come down to the same things that K-State's dealt with all throughout the season. And at the end of the day, look, we we put a lot on coaches. They get paid a lot of money to to fix some of these problems. But at the end of the day, when thinking about it, Jerome Tang didn't get to where he is because he's stupid. Like, he, he knows what he's doing. I think that's a guy that knows, hey, they should cut out the turnovers and they need to be better on defense and they need to shoot the ball better. The problem is some of that you can't fix. Bad shooters are always going to be bad shooters. You can make them a little less worse, but they're always going to be bad shooters. And the other stuff, you can teach it all you want, but – the people you're teaching have to be receptive to what's being taught and they have to be able to have the ability to understand that. Look, I, 
I, I, the only class I failed at K State was macroeconomics. Had to take it a second time and snuck by that puppy. I'm sure I had two fantastic professors for that class at K State, but it didn't matter who taught me or how they taught me or whatever. I was not going to pass that class. Number one, it was boring as hell. I did not care about it one bit. Uh, and I just, I, I didn't want to pay attention to comprehend it. I just screwed around the entire time on my computer or whatever. And, I didn't want to get better in that regard. And we're at a stage now where I start to look at a guy like Cam Carter or Arthur Kaluma, and I don't think that they are wanting to put in the work and open up their ears and hear what they need to hear to actually become better. Cam Carter took a step, we thought, over last season. At the end of the day, though, is that just because his usage is up higher? starting to look a little bit that way. Arthur Kaluma, same type of deal. At Creighton, he was a no doubt about it. You are going to be our third best player at best, maybe. Maybe four for one guy. And while I think these guys have made some improvements, I also think that there are areas that their game could get better, and it hasn't. And I think that their basketball IQ could be better. And Jerome Tang knows this, like, we can ask him about it. He's not going to throw these guys under the bus, so that that is what it is. But I just don't know that they're going to listen at this stage. And I think that's what this comes down to is you have a team that is a full of a lot of guys that don't fully comprehend how to play the game because you can be really talented at it and be successful at it, but that doesn't mean you know the game. I mean, you can listen to any former player. Like I, I'll throw this one out here. On our way up here, I was listening to, to Ryan Rusillo was talking to Andre Iguodala. Andre Iguodala had a great NBA career, all that stuff, played for a long time. Well, Rosillo asked him about, like, okay, hey, end of a game, playoff series, who do, you, who do you want to get you that shot? Like, who is the best option for that? And he gave him a couple of options. This guy goes off the board, and he pulls out some names that you're like, yeah, I mean, like, they're fine, but, like, that's who you're going with. First, he went to Steph Curry. Uh, you know, he's, he's a homer, whatever. Steph, great shooter. But, you know, at times a struggle there. He says Shea Gilgis Alexander, who, again, great player, but like, what are you kind of doing there? Like, players don't always know what's best and how to play the game the right way. And I think that's what we're seeing with this team. I think Tyler Perry, from what we've seen, he knows how to play the game. And sometimes he has physical limitations that prevent him from doing it. Cam Carter and Arthur Kaluma do not have those physical limitations, but they continue to prove. They just don't get it, and there are other guys on this team that don't get it defensively either, and that's what doomed them uh, in their game against Cincinnati and other games. There were too many easy baskets that took place, and you also get turnovers by making bad mistakes, and we saw Arthur Kaluma and Cam Carter combined for 12 of them. So it's tough because we're going to talk about what's coming this week, but at the end of the day, uh, it just seems like we're, we're chasing our tail in circles trying to figure out how to fix these problems. They're not going to get fixed. This team doesn't seem to really want to fix them because if they did, a lot of this stuff is things that you can get better at. Um, you, you can play smarter and the turnovers go down. It's not like these guys can't dribble. You know, Keontae Johnson couldn't dribble, and he still, you know, managed to to make up for that and get better, I think, as the year went on. So it's a it's a tricky thing and it's not a fun thing to think about but at the end of the day I think this team it, they've shot themselves in the foot a few too many times and they've run out of toes to stand on and they're gonna fall over and probably not make the NCAA tournament yeah I mean uh, to your point with the, with the turnovers I mean you, we say this I feel like every freaking game at this point but how many of those weren't even forced like it it, it felt like there were there are just times in the game where especially you see it with Cam Carter and Arthur Kaluma where they're really pressing and trying to hit the home run and they end up turning the ball over or it sometimes it's as simple as not catching the ball because we've seen that a handful of times this season or it'll be like tonight and it, it just feels like and, and I, I open this up to you a little bit of when is the last time you saw Cam Carter finish on a fast break? Because he he turned it over tonight in, a, in one of the worst spots possible. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think I think he's really struggling right now, and I also think there's a part of the Cam Carter thing where he's he's also slumping hard. Like, he's not as bad as he has played. He's he's been bad the last couple of weeks, and that's no doubt on him. And he's got to be better. But there's an element of this which is a slump, and so you you add a slump on top of a guy that already has some weaknesses. That's just going to pile up and lead to this. And I think. You know, he he's having a tough time seeing the ball right now. Like if we were talking baseball and, you know, he's he's gone up there and he's like one for his last 35, he's having a tough time seeing it. I think that's what Cam Carter is right now where, you know, there's starting to be progress. We're starting to see some good at bats. He, he knocked down a couple more shots tonight. And at the end of the day, it felt like he knocked down more. He made two threes on his six attempts, so it was 33%. That's fine. But everything else was still a little bit of a struggle. And, yeah, the turnovers came at critical moments, including one late. And you just and, – and you worry when you see him get the ball now on the break where, you know, early on in the season, like, his skill set, he is finishing on that. And you're like, just take it, go. Now it's like, oh, boy, I hope that's not Cam Carter that has the ball right now. And uh, it turned out – We, we even talked sometimes. about this a little bit uh, before we started recording, and it's the thing that's really haunted K-State throughout the season is that when when Tyler Perry isn't at his best, he is still a lot better than when Cam Carter and Arthur Kaluma aren't at their best. Those two, their floors are really, really low, and, and we've seen that come, by, come and bite K-State in the bud, and we saw that. Uh, against Cincinnati, where those two, if one of them is just average, I think K State probably wins that game because they aren't turning the ball over a lot. They probably only have like two or three, which, which is still not great for a single player. But for them at this stage of where they're at, every once in a while, like two or three, like you, you'll take. But you didn't get either one of them to be even average against Cincinnati, and that that's what ends up costing K State in the end. Yeah, and you know, in Kaluma's case, he doesn't even have to be average. I mean, if he just turns the ball over a few times less, he, he still doesn't have a great night. He was inefficient for it. He missed his free throws too. Like at one point in the game, night there had been 19 what I would call definitive possessions that were on Arthur Kaluma, where it either ended with him taking a shot or going to the free throw line or turning the ball over. And on those at that time he had combined for basically 11 negative situations where he had had either miss shot or a turnover uh, and then and that didn't even include the fact that he was struggling at the free throw line and you look at all that like you can't ever blame one thing but I'm not blaming one thing I'm blaming multiple things that Arthur Kaluma did tonight and um cuz that like that's the other thing too Cam Carter for his struggles tonight, he did make up for it eventually. Like he didn't end up having the worst night shooting the ball. Um, so he kind of started to make a push there, but seems in a tough spot. And we we talked about it in the middle part of the season when they struggled. They need their three guys to be stars consistently. That's not always fair of all three of them, but it's needed. And at this stage of the season, you know it is, and we know what Arthur Kluman and Cam Carter are capable of, just haven't showed it a lot recently. And I, I think, you know, missing them and, and not getting what they have been is, is tough for K-State. So we'll see what it means moving forward and, and everything else. I, I hate <clears throat> bringing this up because I don't expect guys to be perfect, like especially when they go to the free throw line. But in a game where you lose by two, to have Arthur Kaluma be responsible for three of your four free throw misses because you got good free throw games from both David Gasson and Jarrell Colbert, that really hurts. Especially when uh, Kaluma missed a front end, a front end of a one and one too. So to, for him to be three of six and the rest of the team uh, be eighteen of nineteen, that that's not great. And it just goes back to the point of those two have to be really good or at least be a lesser version of or a better version of the bad version of them because when they've been off like it, it it's hard to watch at times because you can see that especially 
just from the mental side of things, you see that they really take it poorly and like you can see it kind of affect other areas of their game when they're not doing well on offense. That's a good point. There, there is a, an element there where I think there can be a little bit of, of pouting and, you know, they can get lack of it. And we see that with a lot of guys on this K state team where they don't get back on defense. They get beat in, in ways like that sometimes. And I, I think Tyler Perry is in a, in a position where he benefits from the fact that he's, always had a deficiency in his life and he's not going to overcome it. It's the fact that he's short. And so he's always had to work harder than everybody else. Same thing as Marquise Noel. And so he understands like, Hey, things aren't going right here, but I gotta be, I gotta do this to stay on the floor, give myself an opportunity. And I just think with other guys, like the game has always come a little bit easier. And so you don't always have to do that. And uh, you, you know, I think we are seeing that like, I think they don't, they don't think through this as much. And um, Tyler Perry is a much more cerebral player than, than what you've gotten from Cam Carter and Arthur Kaluma. And I like the, there are conversations to be had about like, you know, moving forward, like both of those guys and theory, there's talent there, but at the end of the day, like if you're a bubble team this year, like would you rather take your chance with somebody else and just kind of, start fresh. I don't know. That, that's a conversation for a different time, but they struggled tonight. And um, again, it's not fair because other guys have issues on this team. Uh, Will McNair, Jarrell Colbert, David Gasson, they certainly had their deficiencies tonight. You, you lost players that you thought you were going to have. So that hampers depth. But at the end of the day, certain guys have different roles and responsibilities are different for, for different dudes. You know, like I, I have a, I have a family of, of, of three at home and my responsibilities are different than what my wife's responsibilities are. And Elliot is not going to have to do as much as her mom and I, because she's six months old. So, you know, she serves a role in our family, but she's not coming off. We're not saying, oh, Elliot, go out there. You, you got to give us 25 tonight and you got to shoot 40% from three. No, it's like, Hey, mom had a bad day at work. I need you. I just need you to give her one good shot. Give her one good laugh here. You know, M make her forget that. Oh yeah, work was kind of crappy today. Something like that. Uh, I'm not asking a lot. Meanwhile, I, you know, I, I got to carry more of a load on that type of thing. And the inverse of that, where Elliot doesn't know that I'm gone right now. Well, she probably knows I'm gone, but she probably isn't like mm, whatever. But her mom is way more stressed out. Her mom has way more responsibilities she has to step up to the plate and i understand that putting the ball in the hole is a little bit different than than you know being a parent and all this other stuff but i'm just trying to paint the picture that yes there are more players on this team so it's not about trying to bash carter and kaluma but they are two of the top three talented guys on this team they have different roles and they need to step up there are only three guys on this team that have started every game this season Tyler Perry, Arthur Kaluma, and Cam Carter. And there's a reason for that. You're in a different status than everybody else on this team. You got to step up and play like it and come through. And they just haven't been able to do it recently. And and you see Tyler pa Perry floundering because he's this is where I, I think you see the work from Tyler Perry is he was not getting these looks earlier in the season. These teams still know that K-State has nobody else that can shoot on their roster, and they know that Tyler Perry is a good player. But Tyler Perry has found a way to adjust to playing power conference basketball day in, day out. Nobody else on this team has made adjustments. And that is the biggest killer to K-State season right now is that Tyler Perry is the only guy, maybe Day-Day Ames a little, that feels like they've gotten better from the midpoint of this season. I, I'll, I'll add in David Gasson a little bit to, to that discussion because he, he has turned around as playing at a pretty high level. He wasn't great. Uh, Saturday against Cincinnati, but he, he's been pretty good otherwise. And, and you've really hit the nail on the head that I, I was about to bring up of you can see with like the main reason that Tyler Perry's bad isn't as bad as the other two is because Tyler Perry has really transformed his game to not just be a three point shooter. Like he can get to the free throw line. He can drive in the, the other guys like, like you don't really know what you're going to get because there isn't really a good secondary thing that they bring to the table. Like we, we see the Arthur Kaluma turn around fade away in the post almost every game, but I can't remember the last time that that shot went in. It's like you, 
you need guys that have more of a bag, uh, as as the youth say. You need something out of them. You need somebody to step up and do something. So, all right, that's that's enough of the negative stuff. Uh, let's focus on other things that could be negative this coming week, but they haven't happened yet, so there can be a dose of optimism there. It starts on Tuesday. K-State goes on the road, Allen Fieldhouse to face KU. Obviously, and, and you said it You know, when we were upstairs, it's like, you know, and then D.Y. said it too. It, it's funny. As much as this loss sucks now, you went on Tuesday night. Nobody cares. Nobody's thinking about it, all that, because there's the moral aspect of it where people are like, oh, heck yeah, like went over KU and Lawrence, swept them this year. That's a great time. And then there's the actual like benefit to, you know, win in Allen Fieldhouse is significant and you can survive losing a two point game at Cincinnati when you're on the bubble, if you go and get a win in Allen Fieldhouse. So there's that opportunity there for K-State. We know KU's coming off of back-to-back losses. They also recently lost their last game in Allen Fieldhouse against BYU. And this is a team that, you know, Kevin McCuller, his status seems to change every day. He play. Um, so that'll be interesting. But K-State was successful defending Kevin McCuller and Hunter Dickinson the first time. It's a little bit of a different beast going to Allen Fieldhouse, dealing with that crowd. Uh, but what do we think the chances are that K-State can bounce back and have a legitimate chance to win this game? Because at this stage, you got to get at least one more win somewhere along the way in this regular season, and you're facing two difficult teams. KU is probably the weaker team you're facing. You just have to do it in their own building versus coming to home and playing Iowa State. So what what are the chances in your eyes that K-State gets it done, and how do they do it? Oh, boy. That's a, that's a loaded question for two guys that have only seen K-State win in Lawrence one time now, isn't it? Uh, I, I would say <laughs> that the percent chance is probably pretty low because it, it just hasn't been done in our lifetime, but – there's part of me that also is like it would not shock me if this was the team that did it because when this team is good this team is legitimately really good but the, there just hasn't been that consistent consistency there all season uh the the way to do it is to do it the same way that you wanted manhattan but that, that's just been so hard for case to duplicate uh in lawrence but you want the worst players to take the shots that seem that seems very simple, doesn't it? But you want the guys like Nick Timberlake and Elmarco Jackson and, he, and even Dewan Harris to an extent to, to be the ones that sink you. And if you can get uh, Hunter Dickinson to be less efficient like he was in Manhattan, if you get a lesser version of Kevin McCullough, who knows if he even plays because, like you said, his status changes every day after after the uh, the BYU game. It, sounds like Kevin McCullough wasn't going to play the rest of the season and he ends up playing against Baylor. So uh, you can slow him down a little bit. Just make the guys that you are comfortable with be the ones that beat you. And the law of averages happens and it happened to Casey tonight. Like we were talking on our way back to the car of Jizzle James. It felt like was making every mid range shot that he took tonight like you're you live with that as if you're case it like if it's going to be the other team's night i think you're okay with losing because you stuck to the game plan and did well it just sucks and again going back to cincinnati like it sucks when you get beat like that because you've already gotten beat like that once with tcu and it, it it's coming out of crappy part of the season where you can't afford to lose but if case it loses because dewan harris el marco jackson and Nick Timberlake beat them, I, I think that we would both be okay with that. And that's another thing about K-State, not to bring the Cincinnati game fully back into this, but it would be different if tonight this game plays out to a 74-72 final score, and there's a, a lot more things that are even in this. But you go back to Cincinnati, they shot better than what they normally do. They, they had shot makers – that don't normally do what they do in times. They stepped up. They were above their averages. So you could say, man, it was just their night. But that's not a, a fair thing to say when 
you gave them opportunities in other areas because you could have won this game close to handily if you just don't turn the ball over like you did. You gave away 13 free possessions in this game, essentially, you know, plus minus wise. That's a problem. So K State had their own issues in this game. And that's the thing with this team is there's never been a loss this season where at the end of it, the Oklahoma game is about the only one that, you know, looking back, I say, I just don't know what you're going to do there. Like that, you just played a crappy basketball game and Oklahoma figured it out. Every other loss that K-State has suffered this year, the other team played played good and did good things. They took advantage of K-State. So that's props to them. I'm not trying to say K-State, you know, they've lost, what, 12 games now? I'm not saying that all 12 losses are because of what they did, but K-State, they didn't put themselves in a position to say, we got beat tonight. Almost every single loss they have, you can say it has a pretty significant element of we beat ourselves. And I it's going to be interesting to see if they can do that against KU on the road. And you talk about the other guys forcing them to do something. Like, yeah, force those guys to feel like they have to take the shot and, and see what happens there. Recipe to it. I think it's just you you got to kind of hope that your defense is on like it was the first time that the teams played. And this is a very important thing. And I thought about this even before what we saw tonight, but starting fast is such an important part of what K-State needs to do because what road game this season have they gotten off to a good start to? They you know they did it against Texas Tech. Um, um, Oklahoma State, State, they maybe held like a five-point lead for a little bit. LSU, they were kicking their butt up in the first half. All right, there you go. There's there, one one game, and it was against an SEC team that sucks. So they haven't done it in conference play, and they really even like the home games. They haven't gotten off to great starts in a lot of them. So you got to start fast because that was the thing tonight, and. I don't think of a time like that I you know can remember that K State started fast in Lawrence. Like throw that first punch to at least kind of destabilize them. They're going to come back. They're going to have the crowd behind them. But you got to find a way to start quick. And that that comes back to what we talked about with Kaluma and Carter and some of the other guys. The focus has to be there in terms of being mentally sharp. I think this team brings effort. I don't think they show up mailing it and all this other stuff and not wanting to try hard and wanting to win. I just think that some guys, they don't take the mental side of the game as seriously as Tyler Perry does, and as you need to, to be a good basketball team. Uh, I would only add that Oklahoma second half kind of felt like the they kind of quit, and I, I had question the effort. But, yeah, like I, I legitimately can't remember a time in my lifetime, and it's our lifetime, essentially, because uh, you're only a year older than I am. Uh, that case it has started faster or has started fast in Allen Fieldhouse. Like it, it feels like it's K State almost always has to take a timeout before the under 16 timeout in Allen Fieldhouse. So it'd be big for K State if they can get off to a good start. I mean, then it, it, it sounds simple again because it's just the key to this team in every single game. If you can shoot the ball well and get to the free throw line, you're going to have a chance. With, with this team especially, because I, I'm tired of being like, okay, they could limit the turnovers tonight because they've shown no reason to think that they can. So at, at this point, I'm just like, the turnovers are what they are. They have to shoot well and get to the foul line. The only problem with that is they did that against Cincinnati and the turnovers were such a big problem. Now, this goes back to the other thing too, though. Typically, the other, I don't think the other team has had it as low of a turnover number as Cincinnati with six. And that's also concerning with the defense tonight because Cincinnati had been, with K-State, one of the worst teams in terms of turning the ball over in Big 12 play. So. And it's back-to-back it's back -back games now, too, because West Virginia, I think, only had like four or five. Yeah, that's a good point. West Virginia did not turn it over a lot. So we'll see how it goes. Big one in Lawrence for K-State. It seems unlikely, especially with how this team has played on the road. So we'll wait and see what it looks like on Tuesday night in Allen Fieldhouse for K-State. And then obviously they have the big one with Iowa State to finish it off. And you win one of these, you feel like you leave yourself some hope and you're going, you win one, you're probably going to avoid Tuesday at the Big 12 tournament. 
You play starting on Wednesday. That will be a quad one game. Then you play on Thursday. That would be a quad one game. I think over the next four games that K-State needs to have, if they go two and two, they're going to have the opportunity to be in the NCAA tournament. That would put them at, I guess if you go two and two down the stretch there, you'd be 19 and 14. Um, that that gives you an opportunity with, you know, one of those needs to be a regular season conference win and then another in the Big 12 tournament. So we'll see how it kind of finishes off there and where things go. Uh, any other thoughts before we exit here in Cincinnati tonight? Probably not everybody's favorite show, but, uh, you know, running on fumes, doing what we can, and then we'll hit the road and uh, hit football hard next week too over on KSO. Yeah, it just, uh, I don't know. It it felt like this was it. This and D.Y. brought it up. It felt like kind of karma slash revenge for Texas Tech, how you let one slip away to come out and steal one in Cincinnati. And it just, I don't know, it still kind of feels like a gut punch because I was not out on this team like publicly, but I was thinking, okay, like NIT is probably the most likely scenario, so kind of getting that through my head. And then you had the last two wins and how – Oh, no way. If, you, if anybody out there is like looking at bracketology, the bubble is terrible. Like that, that's a reason why the NCAA tournament shouldn't expand, but that's a different topic. Uh, but you, with how everything played out today, even like you, it felt like KCA was kind of like the team of destiny, like determined, like they were going to win this game because of how everything shook out. And then they didn't. So it is what it is. It's a good point you bring up because this is, this is the epitome of – this is kind of like Bruce's last team at K-State. Obviously, wild different in head coach, and people appreciate that. But you think about that team. That team, it was, hey, we're going we're gonna to punch you in the gut every single time you watch us. You're not going to have a lot of fun doing it, and we're going to do enough to maybe make you think, hey, i got to watch this, tune in. I love, I love the Cats, got to support them, want to see them succeed, get in the NCAA tournament. We're going to give you that sliver of hope. But they just make it so dang hard. And I, you haven't been able to enjoy many basketball games this year with this team. And that's the thing, too, where you look back on it. And if they had won the night, awesome, great win. They would have deserved a ton of credit for it and everything. But then you think, okay, we only enjoyed <laughs> a minute of this game. You know, like 39 minutes of this game tonight sucked. You can't have that with this team. And that's the other thing that it goes back to is, they just aren't good enough, and they make they make basketball not very fun to watch. But people continue because it's K State. You know, there's some guys you, that you appreciate and you like on the team, and you, you want to have that opportunity and hope and everything else. But they make it hard, and that's the thing. Last year's team made it easy to like them. Um, other teams in the past, it was easy to like them because they were fun to watch and they you know, they went out and, and, and brought it every single night. But this is what bubble teams are. Uh, w winning does kind of cure all with that, though. I, I'll, I'll add. I'll add that. That's true. That's very true. Uh, but, you know, it's not like Kentucky was winning at a high level at times this season. I bet their fans still have probably a lot of fun. Well, I don't know. They didn't defend, so maybe that ticked them off. But they scored a lot. And then could be still a fun style of basketball. I don't know. We'll we'll see how it goes for K State. Uh, certainly reasons to keep watching them, um, but I'm not going to tell you to be the guy that doesn't turn the TV off early because you know there's no reason to put yourself through too much misery. Although they will probably make it close at the end. They've done that in a lot of road games just to again give you one final kick in the you know what. So we'll see where it goes. Uh, that'll do it for Drew and I here on the KSO show fan will be back with us next Sunday. It's just, it was just, you know, too late for him uh, because it's, it's only, it was only like 10 30 back in Kansas. You know, it wasn't 11 30 or anything like that. And we were, would have recorded earlier if we wanted to, but we appreciate his contributions and uh, understand that guy needs some sleep every once in a while. When you crunch that many ugly numbers, I don't blame you. I, you know, I he's probably having nightmares right now of K State's points per possession or whatever, just bad numbers floating in his head. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow on Monday. I don't know if it'll be Drew or DY with me, but we will talk K State football 
uh, bring a little positivity in your life. Although, I don't know. Maybe we find something negative to talk about there. Probably not. Ben Sennett killed it at the Combine. We'll probably do a little Combine recap for everybody and then uh, some other topics. So, hopefully, you enjoyed this or you just kind of uh, sat here and like, man, uh, it sounds a lot like how I am right now. Not having the most fun with K-State basketball. They very easily could make it fun over the next two weeks. We'll just have to see what happens. It starts on Tuesday night. Drew and I will be there, probably regrettably. So that'll do it for us. And uh, the KSO Show, head over to On3, kstateonline.com.